On one occasion I spoke with an atheist who made a repeated claim. Jesus was a hypocrite, he says. And no matter how many times I asked him for any evidence, he couldn't point to any. There was plenty of evidence in me of my own hypocrisy. There was plenty in himself and his own hypocrisy. There are innumerable instances in Christian history. But having made the charge, he couldn't think of any evidence of hypocrisy in Christ. That's quite astonishing, really, when you think about it. Hypocrisy is almost the defining characteristic of humanity. We cannot bear to be seen for the unrighteous fools that we are, and so we wear masks, we hide, we act and distract. And our speech is the primary way that we do it. The magician Darren Brown says that he performs his tricks through a mixture of magic, suggestion, psychology, misdirection and showmanship. Um, I often think that that's kind of what we do <laughs> in everyday life. We try to pull off some kind of persona with our own performances. We say one thing, but we mean another, and we think another, and we do another. Everyone's a hypocrite, except Jesus. But that should shock us more than it does. You see, no one had more scope for hypocrisy than Jesus did, because no one preached the kind of life that Jesus preached. Let's just take five statements from the Sermon on the Mount. Uh, Jesus says that every jot and tittle of the law must be fulfilled. He said that. He set the bar that high. He said, turn the other cheek. That's setting the bar high. He said, go the extra mile. He said, love your enemies. He said, you cannot serve God and money. And as he sets the bar that high, this, this kind of talk opens him up to the closest scrutiny. He has set the bar so high, even to the point of saying, you must be perfect even as your Father in heaven is perfect. Matthew 5 verse 48. Now, if my opponents were baying for my blood, I can imagine a paralyzing fear over the scandals that they may dig up. But think of the claims which Christ's enemies could hold him to. The merest flaw would open him up instantly to the charge of hypocrisy. And yet, what do we see? We see perfect integrity. Not even his harshest critics could make their charges stick. Here is the one, the, the one man in whom life and lip speak the same language. Perhaps the clearest example of this lack of hypocrisy, this utter integrity. The clearest example is in the hour of his death. Christ maintains his integrity even in the furnace of intense suffering. Luke chapter 23 from verse 32. Two other men, both criminals, were also led out with Jesus to be executed. When they came to the place called the skull, there they crucified him along with the criminals, one on his right, the other on his left. Jesus said, Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. It's the first of Jesus' last words from the cross. And the first word is a word of forgiveness. It's extraordinary to me. You know, when I bump my head, my first thought is of vengeance. When Christ was pierced, he bled mercy. Iron nails are driven through his hands and feet. His body is hoisted onto the upright. His bones are out of joint. He's struggling for breath and he prays, Father, forgive. As he bore the curse of God, Jesus cries for our mercy. And so the teacher who makes the highest demand, love your enemies, he obeys it to its darkest depths. He is as good as his word. But his word is not a judgment upon us hypocrites. It's not even a judgment upon Christ killers. This is what's so astonishing about the righteousness of Christ. It does not make him less sympathetic to sinners, but more. This is why he hangs on the cross. His death is not for the pious, it's for the very people who cause his death. And if you ask me, Jesus' prayer here on the cross is answered very literally and specifically. You see, the next time that this crowd would have gathered publicly was at the Feast of Pentecost. That was the feast in the Jewish calendar that was next in the calendar. And so two months later, these very people who are gathered around the cross, they would have been back in Jerusalem to hear Peter's Pentecost sermon. And you can read in Acts chapter 2, an incredible answer to Christ's prayer. As Peter preaches, 3,000 people respond. They repent and are baptized for the forgiveness of their sins. And it all traces back to this cross and this prayer. 
Really and literally, the Father forgives these very people, the ones who murdered his son. At the end of Moby Dick, Captain Ahab's dying words are words of hate. He despises Moby Dick, and with his last breath he spits venom. From hell's heart I stab at thee, says Ahab. What a difference with Jesus. On the cross, Jesus looks out at those who have caused his death, and he really is in hell's heart. He really is suffering the wrath of God in this moment, but he doesn't say, from hell's heart, I stab at thee. Instead, from the very pit of hell, Jesus has loved us. From hell's heart, Jesus cries out, Father, forgive. What a savior.